It's a real pleasure to welcome you to today's screening of The Sound of Music. Uh, 50 years after its release, it, it remains the most profitable film musical ever made. As our distinguished guest, Professor Carol Flynn, has, reminds us, and I quote, with an original theatrical run of three and a half years and its figures adjusted for inflation, The Sound of Music is, is in fact still one of the three top grossing US films, along with Star Wars from 1977 and Gone with the Wind from 1939. As I was just saying to my colleagues, I first saw this film in 1965 with my Girl Scout troop at Grauman's Chinese Theater, uh, the landmark movie palace in Los Angeles. As much as I fondly recall that event, I'm especially looking forward to today's screening where we were, we're going to change up our usual format by having the Q&A portion first, given the film's length and audience, you're familiar with the film. Um, although you haven't seen it in this theater in the restored print, so you're going to enjoy that very much. Uh, allow me to say a little bit more about uh, Carol Flynn, professor of film, television, and media at the University of Michigan. Carol Flynn is the author of four books and the co-editor of a fifth. She is a foundational scholar in the field of film music and the author of a recent book on the sound of music, which assesses the film's longevity and mass appeal. She is also someone I have known for all, more than three decades, almost four, um, and I share her interest in feminist and cultural theory, uh, musical classics, and issues of kitsch and camp. So hopefully this will be as much fun for you as it's going to be for us. So let me start, so to begin. In your book, you remark on the enduring popularity of the film, explaining that from the beginning, children and adult women were at the core of the film's fandom. Since 1999, when it premiered at London's Lesbian and Gay Film Festival, Sing Along Sound of Music has appeared in theaters, encouraging and extending fan communities. So can you tell us more about the history of fandom for this film? Yeah, the first point is that it was absolutely immediate. Um, Sound of Music was the first film where repeat viewings were um, formed a very significant part of the um, box office sales, and the studios took note of that because that phenomenon really hadn't existed before. It was mostly women and children. Um, sometimes women would go alone. There was one woman reported in Australia who went every day to a theater, and after <laughs> about the 200th time, the theater owner just gave her a pass and let her in free for the rest of the year because she was making the newspapers. Um, <laughs> And children, I mean, like, like uh, Patrice, I, I saw it as a kid. Um, my mother, and I, I always think, it makes me think of my mom because we both loved Julie Andrews and my mother always loved how great her teeth were. <laughs> I thought she, and I love Mary Poppins and my mom got a, a signed autograph so I just thought I was the hippest kid. And, but um, so children and, and women were the first wave, shall we say, and this repeat viewing phenomenon with both children and women, again, women with or without the kids, uh, was a really big deal. And then over time, it, the number of kinds of fans increased, and I think it was also because I just, as a little kid, I, I, don't, I don't know when they form, but, uh, there's a huge Catholic following of the film, which of course makes sense. But when I was working on the, on the book, I saw there were Catholic publications in the US that had covers with this movie on it, just saying this is a film of family values and re respects the church. They of course had, had to hire several people to make sure that none of the church uh, ceremonies or anything appeared ridiculous or inappropriate. Um, in the German papers, there's, or the Austrian paper, there was great excitement because one of the priests who officiates at the wedding was a real priest from the small town outside of Salzburg. Uh, so there was a religious following, and uh, yes, the first sing-along sound of music was at an LGBTQ uh, event in London, and it is, has a huge following among uh, gay communities and still does. And I think the sing-along has really uh, brought that out, but it has also brought out a little bit of a camp factor as well, because it seems so G-rated, 
so white bread, so white, and with nothing about the time. I mean, at the beginning, it says, during the last golden ages of, of Austria or Salzburg, 1938, and you think, what's <laughs> really going on in, in the area in 1938? Uh, so there's plenty to have fun with. Eleanor Parker, I think, does give a delightfully campy performance in an impossible role, just moving her eyes back and forth, looking jealously at uh, Maria. But um, what I think has changed over time is that now the fan culture is a lot more participatory, mm -hmm. and obviously because of um, these sing-along sound of musics, and you can just spontaneously meet people and erupt into song. I, I know a Catholic student group that was in Paris, they were doing the city on bicycles and started singing Do Re Mi um, in the middle of Paris. So um, it continues. So how does the impassioned participation with this film uh, differ from another audience favor, uh, favorite, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which we actually showed uh, last week as part of our Frankenstein series? Um, well, there are just as many transvestites has anyone been to a sing-along sound of music? No? You can Google it and see things on YouTube. Oh my it's goodness. Quite a thing. Um, there are more cross-dressed nuns than you can shake a <laughs> stick at. And uh, the la last one I went to in uh, Ann Arbor, where I live, had a cross-dressed uh, baroness, which made me happy. The baroness and Max finally showed up. So in that regard, they're similar. But uh, one scholar has called uh, The Sound of Music a classic cult movie, and which is different from a kind of uh, cult classic because as the word suggests, you know, the, a cult film is somewhat hidden from view. A midnight showing is ap appropriate. They tend to be transgressive, either in terms of style or content or poor taste, like The Room or what have you, but this one is uh, what's called, a, a, there are fewer of them, you know, classical cult films and doesn't really have that, uh, you can't call this not mainstream um, too, right. too easily. Right. So The Sound of Music has a long pedigree. Uh, the Trap story, first recounted by Maria in 1949, had been made into two German films before Rodgers and Hammerstein musical opened on Broadway in 1959. So can you tell us more about its revival since the film's release, uh, not only in film but on television, and not only in the U.S. but across the world? It has been, um, I'd say that the film has been so often revived, uh, usually theatrically, um, instead of, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, until the live version on television a few years ago, uh, it, <laughs> They hadn't filmed it again. Uh, you know, you just get Julie Andrews every time there's a new DVD release of it talking about it. And, um, but there are a lot of student productions of The Sound of Music. There are when um, in London, in London and then Toronto, uh, this was in the 90s, they, um, there were really big revivals of it. And because of the uh, scope of the revivals, they spun off a reality show in advance of casting it to cast Maria. And so the BBC did this in the UK, and then the CBC did it in, in Toronto, and it was all very strange. Um, but it has been, uh, I think my favorite revival and this is uh, one of the way it's been kind of reconfigured and played with, was uh, there was a synagogue in Tucson and uh, they put on the sound of Purim. <laughs> and the head, uh, the, the rabbi of the synagogue was dressed in the uh, outfit of the nuns and it was just unbelievably fun and strange. So there's revivals of all kinds. It's not just Carrie Underwood. 
good to know. Um, although there's intense love for this film, as you've remarked, there's also those who hate it. You've written, for instance, that many straight men hate it, intellectuals and the guardians of cultural taste hate it, uh, East Coast critics ripped into it, ripped into mm -hmm. shreds, and Christopher Plummer spent most of his career <laughs> referring, it, referring to it as the sound of mucus and tried to keep his distance from it. So can you say more about this intense dislike for the film and certainly tell us more about Plummer's own reasons for wanting to distance himself from it? Yeah, he called it Sound of Mucus. Uh, later in his bi autobiography, he, he referred to it as s and um, And a long time ago, I remember him being interviewed and he say, and he just would dismiss it by calling it that film. Um, and he said, well, it did give me Better, better seats at restaurants. So the, the answer to that is pure snobbism. He, he just thought it was beneath him. Um, Saul Chaplin, who was the musical director of the film, said he would, he would come, to, um, come to the shoot, um, usually in a long cape. And Chaplin thought he was so pretentious that he said like, you know, he's a vampire. Uh, dropping in on us. And one day uh, he came, I think it was for the Something Good song at the end, he came in um, ballet tights and a tutu because he just didn't take it seriously. And I think that explains a lot of people. They just thought the sap factor was too high. And in fact, the Ernest Lehman, and, who wrote the screenplay for the film, and uh, Robert Wise, who directed it, both said, we have to make it less saccharine than the Broadway show. Um, but the thing is, it was received on the East Coast especially as, I mean, the, the gastronomical metaphors are amazing. They'll say, like, this movie will get you diabetes. Um, <laughs> this movie, you know, is, is pure sugar. You, you know, you're going to get cavities from watching it. And, real, and uh, Pauline Kael lost her job by giving it such a, a mean review because it was so, so, so beloved by US audiences that they just thought her nasty review, which is really worth reading because it's very funny. I mean, people refer to it as um, like um, emotions by the numbers. And it is not trying for much sophistication and I think that that, just like a lot of other genres, are, are not paid attention to or taken seriously because it's seen as too lowbrow or beneath them. That's not the feeling I had when I went to Groban's Chinese Theater with uh, at a, you know, an intermission. That, mm -hmm. This was a fancy film. Um, you've <laughs> described this film as a classic, but with a new valence. You call it an emotional classic. Could you say more about that? Yeah. I. When I was writing that book, I wanted to focus on the songs, and because there hasn't there have been several coffee table books, the actors who play the children have written a scrapbook. Uh, there's been a big uh, coffee table book on the production history, but there hasn't been a, there hadn't been a book just talking about the songs themselves, and I think it's because the Richard Dyer once said that when you're listening to the music in musicals, it's always about something else. Um, you know, like declaring a love that can't be said yet, or expressing grief, or inspirational, like climb every mountain. And um, I think I mean, what he said about Sound of Music was that this movie is, a, the music is about the joys of singing. This movie is about just that. And um, so that's, that's an important piece to it. Um, yeah, no, interesting. Well, you know, the film was released in 1965. Um, how would you situate it within the, not just the musical genre, but certainly in US history? I mean, 1965 was a challenging moment for Hollywood, but also for the country at large, ushering in, as you mm -hmm. put it, anti-war protests, the Black Panthers, feminists, the summer of love, psychedelic, um, psychedelia, new demographic and migration patterns, and the decline of white male privilege. So you said, how did other critics beyond Kale respond to the film on its release, and, it's con and within this context of 60s uh, US? Uh, well, I assure you the counterculture uh, 
reviews did not even review it. <laughs> so, but I mean, it's a year after Mary Poppins and two years before Bonnie and Clyde and uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and Easy Rider. So there was a, a fissure. Um, and Robert Wise, the director, himself said if this movie had come out two years later, it, it wouldn't have worked. Um, Julie Andrews was in a film, a musical, two years later that absolutely flopped, Thoroughly Modern Millie. Um, so it was, a, in terms of a musical, it was kind of a last gasp of, of air. And musicals didn't, in my opinion, musicals didn't really regain that kind of enthusiastic popularity, film musicals, until 2003 with Chicago. Um, so that's a lot of fallow time where you get mu musicals like Xanadu and other dubious kind of things. Um, but in terms of what else was going on in Amer American culture, I think there's a multiple ways of looking at it. You can look at it as a last gasp or nostalgic celebration of, of white male privilege, being with nature, unsoiled nature, of not having, you know, even being able to beat Hitler by crossing the mountains um, when the real family said all they had to do was buy a train ticket, but uh, <laughs> they just cross the mountains and they're free from Hitler. Uh, but I think that just looking at it that way, though, ignores that a lot of the things that were going to happen in the 60s were already coming up. I mean, it's not like the, think of civil rights, which oh, had yes. been going on for, for 10 years. And I think it's important to realize that the 60s were, um, involved a strand of multiple kind of cultural and social patterns. And so this was, this was a very mainstream one, but it's not as if all of a sudden everything right. turned after the film. But I think I do think that Wise was wise in saying that two years later it might have been too late. Mm. They, didn't, they didn't know it would be this big. They knew it would be good, but they didn't know it was going to be this big. Can you tell us a little bit about how the film presents the relationship between church, Maria and the nuns, and the state uh, as represented by the military uh, hero, uh, George von Trapp? Um, you say in your book that the film is at pains to soften and ennoble these institutions, um, and yet uh, my own sister said, you know, she's wondered her entire life why the nuns don't get to attend the wedding. Could you say more about church and state? I will. Um, I think in one way, just in terms of the film's own logic, they elevate both of these things to make the wedding scene a real culmination, narrative culmination, and a, a great spectacle, which of course it is. And it kind of marks the end of the first half, even though the intermission was scheduled differently and when it was released as a road movie. But uh, I think narratively that's why they're doing it. But there, you can also read that making them so grand was a way to avoid the involvement of both institutions in wow. World War II. Right. There were plenty of churches, <clears throat> the majority of churches, that didn't um, oppose Hitler, and of course the military were deeply involved in it. And the, I, one of the things I learned when um, researching this is that the original uh, Georg von Trapp, his, uh, it was his, he got the honorific von from uh, World War I when he, uh, he, he uh, torpedoed an enemy, uh, an enemy uh, submarine. And at any rate, the first, his first wife, who was named Agatha Whitehead, was the daughter of an, from England of the inventor of the torpedo. So those things were already linked. And they, those families, when they got married, were both so famous that it was if it was almost like compared to U.S. history, like JFK's, uh, or uh, sorry, of a, a British wedding, or uh, I mean, they were really famous families. So um, 
I think there were both of those things going on. I, as, oh, why don't, why, what about the nuns? They are participating, they're singing. They act, they, in production, they brought in extra voices to thicken the sound of the voices, but why they're left behind that gate is uh, kind of strange. It's like, maybe it's like a, a visual chastity belt, I don't know. But <laughs> it's, uh, and it's so gothic, it, it, mm. you see sort of signs of it coming back in that old Gwen Stefani and, uh, music video when she does Wind It Up and she does a kind of S&M postmodern mock-up with a lot of lonely goat herd, but she has a lot of those iron fences in it too. Hmm. Tell so us a little bit about both. Edelweiss. Edelweiss. It's not a traditional Austrian song at all, but it functions in several important ways in the film, not least of all in sof softening the character of the captain and having him join his family in the world of singing. I mean, this is his halting. He becomes part, um, and we'll talk more about non-musical characters and musicals in a minute, but um, what, would you, what could you tell us about Edelweiss and how, how, it, how it got in this film? Edelweiss was the last song written for the play. It was um, written uh, in tryouts for the play. Um, and it would be the last song that Oscar Hammerstein, the lyricist, would work on. Um, Edelweiss represents the good nationalism. And uh, Herr uh, Zeller, who of course hates music, is the bad nationalism. Of, of, uh, of the film, but it, it has been so, it's, it's, a, it's written in the Broadway style. There are some formal details that make it a little strange for a Broadway song, but not much. And it's written very simply, m mimicking a lot of patterns of a folk song. So I th it has kind of gone down in, in our un a, a kind of cultural unconscious as being the song of Austria so much so that when uh, Reagan was president, he played it when an Austrian ambassador came to visit the States thinking it was the national anthem of Austria. So um, it wasn't. <laughs> so that function, I think, is very interesting. And um, even there's a musicologist named Raymond Knapp who did a beautiful analysis of the song, looking at the lyrics that that show the kind of undercurrent of racial obliviousness in the film and obliviousness to the Holocaust. You know, clean and white, pure and bright, bless my homeland forever. So it's, it's it has a, a kind of contemporary flair. <laughs> of its time. <laughs> so there's that. And then I think what's, what's really fun is the, that his masculinity, like here, here is uh, an actor who, absolutely hated the project and had contempt for it. And he, when he first sings Edelweiss is when everyone cries, you know, because he's come to sing again. He sings the sound of music a little bit, hugs his kids, and then he goes on to Edelweiss. And his voice cracks, and then the second time, in the family setting, and then in the public setting at the Salzburg Festival, his voice cracks and Julie Andrews has to rescue him and all that. So it's like, this harsh military stern father is softened through that song. And it just reminds me a bit, uh, like Mary Poppins had softened their father figure too by the end of the movie. And I think that was a, a big fantasy for a lot of people. I mean, a lot of kids, I know like, like me, we love the movies, but I, I can't tell you how many uh, people I've met of about our age that say this, this was the kind of, he turned into the kind of father that we never had. So it was a, fulfilled that kind of fantasy too. And Plummer, who tried to do his own singing for the film and has a decent voice actually, um, was dubbed in the end and he called, complained that it was castrating, mm. which I thought was an interesting choice of metaphors. Um, and he said he felt like he did his best sitting in um, something good, which is, in my opinion, the worst song of the whole film. But um, he, 
the, the kind of cracking of masculinity that's associated with that song to get him to be a more compassionate father who gets authority in other ways. And, and, and that's at Maria's character's expense. You know, once, once they are married, the show, you know, she doesn't move, she's not the badly behaved Maria. She's not a problem anymore. That movie, that got resolved in the wedding when you hear a reprise of how do you solve a problem like Maria, and which even as a kid that confused me why they played that then. But um, there's no new songs, mm -hmm. and uh, he becomes the head of the family, and she becomes passive. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about some of the other characters like Max and Elsa. You say that they are the big misfits in this musical which celebrates music and their non-singing characters, and they're deployed differently in the film. So if, as you just said, as Christopher Plummer's ca uh, character was softened, but you know, because he gets his authority in other ways, but he doesn't have to be authoritarian with his children. Uh, tell us about these other characters and how they function in the film. Um, first of all, I'll just say I'm a huge fan of Elsa and Max because they don't get the love. Um, in the Broadway version, and, and, and if, did people see the, the Carrie Underwood thing on TV? And you've survived, that's good. But they did the Broadway version of it, and, um, and, the, and they're allowed to sing, these two characters. Hmm. They sing with, the, and they sing grown-up songs. And they sing with the captain on two of them, and they're very fun songs. And one of them even direct, uh, indirectly alludes to the war, it was called No Way to Stop It, a crazy planet full of crazy people somersaulting all around the sun. And, and through the songs, the captain and Elsa's political differences became manifest. They're not even there in the film. She's just presented as a gold digger despite being wealthy. Um, I'm probably gonna go on too long about this because like, it really gets me angry. Um, but I'm sure this was answering many people's questions they've had about this film. <laughs> Wise and uh, Lehman, the screenwriter, when they got the rights to the, to the play, they immediately decided Elsa, well both of them, she will not sing. And they took her voice away from her. And if you saw the TV version with Laura Benati, playing the governess with such spirit. I mean, she, was, she and Audra McDonald were the two highlights of the show. She brought such vivaciousness to the role. And in the theater version, she was also less stupid. Uh, she recognized the love between Georg and uh, Maria early on and had a graceful exit. And as I was reading subsequent screenplays, that dignity uh, diminished, mm -hmm. and then you get this kind of green-eyed uh, villain. And in fact, um, Lindsay and Krauss, who wrote the book for Broadway, they actually sent a letter to Robert Wise because he shared the the drafts with them, and he said, "You shouldn't do this to Elsa. You are turning her unnecessarily into a villain." And the black and white nature of the film, you know who the good guys are, you know who the bad guys are. On stage, Rolf, for instance, did not turn the family in, mm -hmm. and in the film, he does. So you've got good and evil marked very simplistically in the film. And it breaks my heart, because you've got an amazing actress like Eleanor Parker, um, whose talents are lost in this. She's just, and then Max, uh, they were considering hiring Noel Cower to do it. They wanted someone who was charming and, uh, and uh, who mooched off others. And we get the mooch, but we don't get the charm and high class. And my reading of him, I'd love to hear from others, but I, I feel like a lot of the film just doesn't address Jewishness at all, too. And there was a little bit of that placed on to Max. Mm -hmm with that evil stereotype of being money grubbing and so forth. And neither Elsa nor Max have any family connections. They're not religious. They are not in the military. So all the important institutions of the film, they're floating free from all of those things. So they do keep, get to keep Max, but um, 
Yeah. Elsa has to go back to Vienna. Yeah, interesting. Well, most musicals, you've touched on this earlier in our conversation, but you know they don't depict the lives of their characters after the wedding. Um, and you say that the, the film actually comes to a screeching halt after the wedding. Um, could you yeah, say, do you have other thoughts about it? I mean, you say her, I mean, uh, Maria becomes, you know, much more of the mother figure to Liesl. Um, but I just wondered, why was that choice made? The end of the film, how is it compared to other versions? I, I don't know why they, ch the, one of the differences between the play is that they wanted to, um, again, get rid of the sap and, and I always felt that once the two were married, not only does Maria become dull as can be, and you know, doesn't move, doesn't sing any new songs, defers to the captain, uh, the, the narrative they put in there for the film version was, I thought, more like a caper, mm. you know, an action caper with the nuns dismantling the Nazis' car and stuff like that. And I never thought that that worked, really. Uh, so it's a whole, almost a different movie, and the lack of singing. So I, I think they wanted to go for more adventure so that it wasn't, um, it wasn't purely about the children. Maybe that they thought that was a way they could get more people in the theater beyond the women and children. I don't know, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's very unsatisfying, I've, I've always felt, and, uh, and the play wasn't like that. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I have one final question, um, but I hope that you can give us some good zingers on this one. But I wonder uh, if you could tell us about the afterlives of and influence of the film. What's the strangest, and you've already mentioned a few, so maybe you've already picked your favorite strangest, but what are the strangest or most compelling adaptations of the film or one of its many numbers that you've come across and why do you find it interesting but really... There's been so many. My favorite has to be Sound of Purim, I, yeah. I, I have to say, but there, <clears throat> there were, there's various remakes of the trailers that turn it into a horror film a student at York University in Canada uh, did a trailer for it that was hysterical. It was um, uh, it was a hip hop version, and the voiceover said, "In a world that was black and white, she was gray." And they started going into a hip hop version of the show, <clears throat> which I thought was pretty good. And there uh, have been endless flash mobs in various locations, uh, scaring people. And uh, I, I don't know, the Carrie Underwood was almost a scary version, a version that scared people too, but it's had less, I think, of an influence on other musicals than its own afterlife. Uh, we're told what to do at sing-alongs with it, and everyone knows the songs, uh, it's, it's just there, kind of in the cultural air yeah. of the U.S. Yeah. Well, I know this is a long film. Um, you didn't really only come out to see us. Uh, <laughs> so um, I want you to join me in thanking Professor Carol Flynn for discussing the film in advance. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully it'll give you some insight as you're watching it now with new eyes. Thank you. Okay, thanks.